Hi everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to Lecture 9. So by this point, we've basically done most of what we're going to do in terms of literature, right? I've given you the, the lectures on the literature, we've analyzed them, we've talked about them. And so Lecture 9 and 10, they will basically both be serving two, two parts. The first part, obviously, will be to help you fine-tune your expression, the you know subject-verb agreement and stuff like that. Um, I think we get to that in Lecture 10. Today we'll be doing you know a few other things. We'll start with spelling. I'm not joking, okay? But I have a few things to say about that. All right, and then uh, I'm just looking here. Just want to see. Just get ahead of myself here. Yeah. So we'll do a bit of subject verb agreement today, as a matter of fact. And then in week 10 we'll do more style and things like that, right? But getting a bit more sophisticated because right we're ready to do your final paper, okay? And so the second point would be obviously the final quiz. So let me be very, very clear right now. The final quiz, the second quiz. Uh, grammar quiz will be not only based on material from lectures 9 and 10, but will also be based on, I can't even remember the number now, but when we talked about the comma rules and the possessive case, in other words, it'll be the culmination of everything. Okay, so just to, to let you know. And then uh, down the road, lecture 11 will simply be a review. That, that, that's all it is, and you'll notice on the course outline, I think I've got a whole lot of question marks around lecture 12, and I think I explained all that already, okay? In, in other words, there will not, you will not be getting a video for, for the, the, the lecture 12. There will be no video. And again, if I need to explain that now, I will quickly. In, in the 12th week, that's where, you know, I hand back papers or quizzes that weren't picked up and, you know, we chat and what have you, all right? So obviously that won't be happening. That's not to say that we can't have office hours, right? And uh, you know, so get into all that as well. All right, so let's talk a bit about spell check. Right, all of your computers, right, come with a spell checker, but you shouldn't rely on your spell checker for everything. And so we start today just with a poem, and I'm not going to go through it obviously with you. You've got it, but just take a look at a spell check. If 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 you actually had this on your computer right now, some of you do. I think it catches maybe two or three of the mistakes that are in this poem. Okay, and so I'm just trying to give you an idea of how you you shouldn't rely on technology for everything. As a matter of fact, I've seen, I've, I've noticed many individuals who have um, uh, grammar check, and many of the grammar checks out there are horrible. They're absolutely horrible. So again, it's, it's best to know the rules, right? Remember, again, what we talked about when I gave you the crash course and all of that, and implement that instead, okay? And so, as I'll just read a couple of lines here. I have a spelling checker. It came with my PC. It plainly marks for my review mistakes I cannot see. So how many how many mistakes there? Twelve, okay, fourteen, and spell check doesn't catch any of them. All right. So what I'm really getting at here is when you have a word like from, that's one of my favorites. Okay, the word from, but instead you write form. That's the kind of thing you want to watch out for. So what I'm really saying for your final paper, edit your paper. Don't think the spell check is going to do all the work. Okay? All right. And so, I, and I think that, I hope I'm proving the point there. I don't want to take 15 minutes on that. It's pretty clear, pretty clear. So as I said, technology is great, okay, for many things, but it won't do everything. That's, that's my only point. All right? Okay. And so let's consider a word. And I'm going to go off the notes here just a bit, all right? You've got the notes, so I'll just do a bit of, you know, free flow or what have you. Think of a word like ride. And if you've ever wondered, by the way, why do we have that silent E at the end of the word ride? Well, actually, at one time, if you go back to something called Middle English and then Old English, that word would have actually been pronounced ride, ride. Right. If you if you've ever seen Monty Python, right, the knights that say knikta. <laughs> right? Okay, but that is the way that word would have been pronounced at the time. Anyway, okay. So I'm simply trying to show you here. There are certain words. For instance, uh, think of a word, uh, ridding, R I D D I N G. This is something I noticed when I when when computers when I started to deal with computers and, and, and teaching and all of that. Ridding was was a very common mistake, or ritting. Okay, W-R-I-T-T-I-N-G. There is no such word. But for ridding, there is such a word. So I am ridding my house of all the clutter. Okay, so, so that word exists. So if you wrote ridding, 
but you meant to write riding, then spell check wouldn't catch that. So uh, like I said, I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on this, but be aware of the rules. All right. Be aware of the rules. And so when you keep the final silent E, when do we drop the final silent E? That's all you got to know. And it's really simple, really simple. And, and spell check will catch most. Okay. Just to be honest, spell check will catch most, but not all, not all. All right. So here's your little rule right there. You've dropped the final silent E when adding an ending beginning with a vowel, right? Okay. And then you keep it when you add an ending beginning with a consonant. And so you see my two examples there. And again, you know, as I said, you've got the notes. Normally in class, I would give a bit of extra time. We'd talk about that. But you've got the notes. You've got the example. It's all there for you. So uh, I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. All right. Now, there are three exceptions to the rule. And spell check, spell check will catch these three. But there is one word in particular. So let me just quickly show you. Um, yeah, we've got the word argument, ninth, and then truly. Be aware of the word truly, okay? For some reason, people like to keep the E. And so that could be a killer when it comes to, say, a cover letter. If you end off your cover letter with yours truly and you spell it with an E, right? That dead giveaway, chances are, the, 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 the uh, possible employer won't even look at your resume. So again, just be aware of that one, all right? Okay. And so the... the um, there are a couple of exceptions there, and I give you the examples, right? When you have a soft C, okay, or a soft G, and so the examples I give, noticeable, no, notice, notice the C sounds like an S, right? That's what we mean by a soft C, right? As opposed to K. <laughs> All right, anyway. And then outrageous, right? As opposed to G. G. All right, anyway. And then this, the rule now for doubling the final co consonant, right? That goes back to writing. Okay. So, uh, and it sounds a bit complicated, but, but it's not. And I, I should also tell you, I really don't know how long the lecture will be today. I think it's going to be a bit shorter than normal, all right? Um, although I don't know why I tell you that. You can always see it at the bottom, can't you? You know exactly how long it's going to be. But anyway. And so when you're adding an ending beginning with a vowel, we're talking about doubling the, fi the consonant now, du doubling the final consonant, you... Um, when you're adding an ending beginning with a vowel, right, and you've got all the examples there, you double the final consonant, okay, of the root of the word. The root would be, you know, the, what you start with before you add anything to it, right? And so you would double it if the root word ends with a single consonant preceded by a single vowel, okay, and is stressed on the last syllable. And so, right, submit, submit. So, single consonant preceded by a single vowel, and the stress is on the second syllable. And the example I have there is commit, commit. And that's your rule. So like I said, spell check will catch these things right 99% of the time, but there are times where it won't. So I just want you to be aware of that, okay? It's brutally hot outside. It's funny, if you're watching this in the winter, you'll notice I'm sweating. I was just outside doing a few things, and it is, it is hot today. Anyway, Rule number three, uh, I think you all learned this as children, didn't you? I before E, except after C, or when sounds like A as in neighbor or way. And then there's more to that as well. I don't know why I included that, to tell you the truth, because the fact is, spell check will catch those. If you make those, as a matter of fact, except for some of your programs, it'll fix it even as you're writing, right? Like, I've noticed that. I've made that mistake a couple of times when I'm writing something really quickly, right? And so it'll, it'll just you know, it, it reverse them or what have you. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to do with spelling. As what I'm, all, all I'm trying to show you is don't rely on technology for everything. That's all, okay? All right, now, now we're gonna get into some more sophisticated subject verb agreement, okay? So let me just give you a quick example. We're here in Ottawa, so that's why I'm gonna give this example. The Ottawa Senators, okay, and now you have a choice, is or are a great slash horrible, <laughs> if you're a Leaf fan, right, okay? So the Ottawa Senators is okay, or are, you have the choice, you have to figure out what the verb is, all right, a great, uh, a great slash horrible organization, okay, and choose your, you know, like, make your choice. Most of us would want to put the word are. 
because the, the word senators ends with an S. In fact, that's not true. The answer is actually the Ottawa senators is in this one particular case. I'm going to go through the rule, then I'll come back to that example. So, sometimes a subject will, they can be tricky, all right? They'll look singular when they're actually plural. And then they'll look plural, but they're actually singular. The example of the senators I just gave is an example of something that looks plural, but is actually singular. The key, right, because I, I included the word organization. I'm talking about the Ottawa Senators as one unit, okay? The organization itself. So that's a verb, okay? Sorry, that's a subject that looks plural, but actually it's singular. Then of course we can have, you know, the plural, the members of the Ottawa organization. Okay, well then, that, that's very clear, right? In that case, it's gonna be plural, right? R. So, but you want to watch out for certain subjects that, as I say, look plural, but they're singular, or look singular, and they're actually plural. So, let's just look at a couple of these things, all right? Okay, let's just look at a, at a couple, okay? I know that's not tea. It's too hot for that. That's juice. Anyway, so the first thing we'll look at is something called a collective noun. And I'm sure many of you are aware of these things, right? But, I'm, but I wasn't. I wasn't when I first came to university. There are many rules that I was never shown, all right? So uh, a collective noun is simply a noun, okay? We've been through that, you know, person, place, or thing. It's weird how that's the only thing we remember from high school. It's the only thing I remembered from when I first came to university. That was the only thing I remembered in terms of grammar and all of that. Person, place, or thing. Everyone remembers that for some reason, okay? Uh, adjective, adverb? No, that's where you kind of, hmm, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> anyway, so a collective noun. So you've got a noun, person, place, or thing, but now it's collective. A collective noun is a word naming a group. Organization was a good example of that. Okay. I've got. I, I've given you. As I said, this won't be. This lecture won't be as long as it would be in class, only because you've got the notes. So there's a whole lot of examples that I've given you there. All right. So let's just look. Let's just look at the the, the quick rule. Right. Very straightforward. Okay. Yeah, we're already on page four. This might only be half an hour today. Actually, though, when we get to something at the end, we may take a bit longer, all right? But anyway, it's really simple. And there's your rule right there. Put a star beside it at the top of page four. When you're referring to the group as a unit, right, use a singular verb. When you're referring to the members of the group individually, then you use the plural verb, just like what I did before with the Ottawa Senators, right? So if I'm talking about just the organization, is members of the Ottawa Senators are. That's it. Right? Am I talking about one unit or am I talking about number of units? Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, I, I can't stress enough where we're going with this, this, this next bit. If you have multiple subjects, let's just say you have more than one subject in a sentence, or, or you think you have more than one subject in a sentence, as long as you connect multiple subjects with the word and, okay, then you know your verb will have to be plural, right? Right. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of things here, but then I'm going to warn you of a couple of phrases, all right? Okay, so, and, and I, I'm going to do this again in lecture 10. It's going to come back again in lecture 10, I'm pretty sure, okay? O only because we make th this mistake so often. So watch out, all right? Okay, Watch out when you're joining phrases with, 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 with words such as or, either or, okay, neither nor. There's one to, to watch out for, okay? And so, just note what I have in, in the notes. If it, you, basically, in these cases, the verb will agree in number with the nearest subject. That sounds really vague, doesn't it? I mean, if, if, if I was watching this now, if I were you, okay? We'll talk about that as well, the subjunctive, all right? If I were you, you ever wondered about that? Why isn't it if I was you? It's it's a weird verb thing. Anyway, we might even end off with that. Um, and so when you're joining, it, it, it's almost better for me, instead of giving you the rule, which I just did, right? The, that the verb has to agree with the closest subject. Take a look at the two examples that I have, all right? Neither the prime minister nor the cabinet ministers 
So notice we've got two subjects, okay? Prime Minister is a subject, Cabinet Ministers, subject. Cabinet Ministers is plural. So I'm supposed to put R, R responsible. But if I flip that, and if I wrote neither the Cabinet Ministers nor the Prime Minister, then the answer would be is. So note it, it what, whatever the the uh, the closest subject to the verb, right? That that's where you have your agreement. I didn't know that until I started teaching these things. I had no idea that that was the case. I'll be honest with you. Not too many profs would pick up on that, right? It, like it's a pretty fine point, right? But I just thought I, I'd show it to you, right? Only because I, I thought it was interesting. Now here we go, and you'll notice I have this bolded, right? I hope that last part was clear. I think it's pretty clear when, once you see the examples, right? If I didn't have examples there, I think that would be very vague. But there, there it is. Now, with the examples, I think you get it. Okay. This next part, notice, I've got, I've got one phrase bolded. It's a phrase that people use, and it screws them up. So, when you have phrases, okay? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of the best way. Let's just concentrate on, on this one phrase, as well as. A phrase like that can be a style record when it comes to your writing, okay? And I'm not exaggerating. It can, it, it can ruin an entire sentence. Take a look, okay? Take a look at the example that I have. Well, so first of all, phrases such as, as, uh, as well as, together with, in addition to, including, right? They're not part of the subject. Um, okay, they're not, uh, so I just want to be very, very careful with the way I do this. Yeah, so they're not part of the subject. So let's just say, I'm, and this is going to be a bit confusing, okay, but then I'm going to suggest something. We're in first year. There's no reason why you can't, like, either avoid certain phrases or or use certain words, right, when, when you know you're correct, as opposed to trying to get sophisticated and being incorrect. It's always best to take the route where you know, no, you're correct on that, all right? So let me just show you something here, okay? My typing teacher, as well as, okay, my advisor. Now, and again, this is going to sound confusing, but then I'm going to fix it for you. You would think that you, wanna, you would want to choose have, right? Because it looks like there's two subjects in that sentence. There aren't. Because you chose to use the phrase as well as, now that is no longer part of the subject. In fact, the answer, okay, and I, if I was doing this in class, I would not have included those commas, right? Only, only to, see, to really confuse you, I would have said, okay, so punctuate the sentence and give me the correct verb. If, it's, it's nuts unless you know exactly how this stuff works. Don't worry, I'm going to fix in a moment. My typing teacher, as well as my advisor, Okay, the answer is has, singular. Typing teacher is the only subject in that sentence. Okay, now you're confused, right? Well, what did I, basically, what did I tell you in the second lecture? I think it was in lecture two. Eliminate. If you're not sure, eliminate. Let's rewrite this sentence. My typing teacher, okay, who's your daddy? I think I mentioned that before, right? But it's true. My typing teacher and my advisor, well, now it's have. Be because you joined okay, the subjects with the word and, now you know. No, it, I've got two subjects now. Okay? And I don't need those commas. So notice when you include a phrase like as well as, in addition to, you think you're getting sophisticated, but there's a very good chance all you're doing is complicating and really making mistakes for no reason. So if you, for a first year course, if you're having trouble with these things, not just in this course, but in all of your courses where you have to write essays, use the word and whenever you're unsure. And as long, when you have to join things. And as long as you do that, you'll always be using a plural verb. That's it. That's it. Okay, so shall I do that one again? So when I include as well as, all of a sudden now, I've created, we'll see this in lecture 10. It's actually called a subordinating clause, all right? But, but don't worry about that for now. And, and as a matter of fact, when I get to it, I'll explain it in, in, in plain language, all right? We'll get to it. And so 
I keep saying that. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. Death? Uh, I'll get to it. <laughs> All right. Anyway. And so my typing teacher and my advisor have. But if I write my typing teacher as well as, then I need the, uh, not only do I need the commas, but then it's has. And I, it just confuses the heck out of, out, of, out, of, out of the writer, at least out of a first year writer. So go back to your friend and is your friend. Okay, I won't say that phrase again. <laughs> all right. Who's your daddy? Anyway, all right. You, I think you need a couple of laughs at the end of the term, right? Right. We're all we're all feeling the same way. So, anyway, um, the next one is I think pretty straightforward. When, when you have words like someone, something, somebody, or what have you, right? They're always singular. When they're used as a subject, always singular. So no big deal there. Yeah, we're flying through this. It might be about a half an hour. Okay. Anyway. Um, so when used as subjects, there you go, they're always singular, right? Okay, so, so in other words, then your the verb would be singular as well. Somebody is going to get hurt, okay? And obviously, if you wrote somebody are going to get hurt, it just, <laughs> right? right? But it is funny how sometimes things that don't sound right are correct. Go back to Ottawa Senators. The Ottawa Senators is a great organization. Let me, let me give you a quick example. I'll go back and give you another example of that, all right? The Tampa Bay Lightning, for those of you, Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, that's a hockey team, okay, or a hockey organization. The Tampa Bay Lightning is a great organization. Doesn't sound so bad there. Let me give you even a, a different example, all right, when we're talking about subjects and verbs. Okay. I'm going to give you one that will, won't sound right at all, okay? I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I'm trying to think of bands you guys know. Um, Silver, Silver Sun Pickups, okay, is a great band. Okay, um, I don't know if you know Silver Sun Pickups. I'm just trying to think. I'm trying to think of, of, of a group that ends in S. Uh, okay, let's do the most obvious one then. Uh, we'll do, the, okay, the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones is a great band. That doesn't sound right at all, does it? Right? But it is correct. Okay, U2 is a great band. Now all of a sudden, sounds fine. Right? That just goes back to that whole idea of multiple, singular, and all of that. But yeah, think about that. U2 is a great band. You wouldn't say U2 are a great band, because in that case, that doesn't sound right. So it has to do with that S ending, once again. Okay? So, And I'm backtracking a bit, because I just thought of that example, and I think it's a good one. Right? The Rolling Stones is a great band. Well, talking about them as a unit, right? Then, no, no. One thing. U2, one thing. U2 is... And like I said, in that case, sounds fine. So there you go. All right. Yeah. So now we're on page five. Yeah, man, we are flying. Anyway. When you have phrases or words, okay, like each, either, okay, or neither, when they are the subject, okay, once again, then they take on the singular verb. So either was suitable or each wants to win. Straightforward stuff, right? Okay. And then there's one one last thing we could talk about here with, with subjects and verbs, right? And that has to do with something called a helping verb. A verb can be one word, but it can also be a group of words, right? Okay, a clause, remember going back, way back. And so there are these things called helping verbs, that we we need we like sometimes we need more than one word. I'll, I'll get, I've got a whole list here for you. All right. Um, think of a word like think of, look at all the ones I've got there for you. Shall, should, may, might, etc., etc., etc. Okay. So I shall uh, uh, um, I shall I shall going to the store. Right. I shall I shall be going to the store. I may. Going to the store. No, I may be going to the store. So quite often, when you see that you have a verb ending in ing, okay, going, okay, hitting, whenever you have a verb ending in ing, that's where you will need helping words, okay, helping verbs. And I would argue that if you grew up with the English language, you know that through osmosis, right? You know what I mean? You don't even need a rule. You just know it. But for those of you who are learning English, if there might be a couple of you in the class who are still learning English, or, okay, or at least your English skills aren't, aren't 100%, well, 
well then that's a good rule to know because that's one of that's one of the more common uh, mistakes that writers make if they're if they're not 100 percent familiar with the language so be aware of that one too okay and so and and then and then we get into right multiple subjects and verbs you know sentences can have one, more than one subject or they can have more than one verb those things are obvious but notice the way i've written them florence and rome are two beautiful cities in italy okay so because i've got the and there i know it's r but there's so many other ways i could have constructed that sentence aren't there i could have constructed that sentence in so many different ways and made it confusing okay and by the way, if you ever go to Italy, Florence and Rome, Flo Florence is one of the, the greatest walking cities in the world. Everything is concentrated and you, you, you can spend a day and see most of the sites. Obviously, when you go into the museums, you could spend, you know, weeks in each. But um, Rome, on the other hand, is a nightmare. <laughs> you got to really watch out for traffic in Rome. OK, uh, yeah. Anyway. All right. And then we can have multiple verbs. I'm, I'm kind of boring you now. This is all so obvious, I think. He elbowed and pushed his way through the crowd. And then I'm not even going to read it out. You can have multiple subjects and multiple verbs, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, I figured about a half an hour. I purposely, we talked about this, by the way. Our department actually talked about this, that we wanted the lectures to be a bit shorter as we got near the end of the course, right? You've been through a lot, right? And so, I mean, through, you know, papers, email what have you and so probably the, the next lecture as well will be only about a half an hour and the, the, the final lecture will only be maybe 20 minutes right so we'll make them shorter and shorter right as i said you, you've got a lot on your plate i realize that and so a couple of things here um the, the, the rules that we have here like the actual definitions for the rules they sound way more complicated than when i show you the examples all right so let's take a look at something called a compound noun and there's there's different types you can have what's called a hyphenated compound all that means like think about it okay you have a noun person place or thing then you have more than one word that makes up the noun compound okay put them together and so we have hyphenated compounds some sometimes very rarely by the way um and and it, it seems like the hyphen itself is kind of going out of fashion i don't know if you've noticed that very few words have hyphens anymore. I predict that, you know, 20 years from now, we might not even be using hyphens at all when it comes to nouns. We might just have spaced compounds. In, in other words, we would just drop the hyphens and have, for instance, look at the example there, mother-in-law. Why do we need the hyphens there? Okay. And so, and again, I don't know if anyone would ever bust you on something like that because people don't even know these rules, right? So there you have it. And so I don't like this definition. So follow me. I'll show you what I mean by I don't like this definition. When you're trying to pluralize okay, a compound noun, hyphenated or spaced, you pluralize what is known as, now this is just the definition. I'm going to explain it better, I think. You hyphenate, uh, sorry, you pluralize the chief element of the noun, of the compound. Okay. Well, when I hear that, I would think the chief element should be the thing that remains the same, right? The constant. But in fact, it's not. It's actually the thing that can change. So I could have a mother-in-law. I could have a brother-in-law, a sister-in-law, father-in-law, right? You see what I mean? So the rule is actually that you pluralize the thing that could change. Mother's-in-law, not mother-in-law's. Even though I know we, we say in-laws, right? Like just in the in the pejorative or, or in the uh, just co like like common day language, right? But the actual rule is that you pluralize the chief element, the word, the thing that could change. And so here we have governor's general, okay? Because you could also have a surgeon general or lieutenant general. In each of those cases, okay, the word that can change, that's the word you pluralize, okay? And again, if we were in class, I could really screw you up on that because I could actually show you an example of something that, that yeah, okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, right? And by the way, I don't think, yeah, on the quiz, I won't have either of those two. I just thought I should point that out to you down the road just so you know what, how to pluralize words like that, okay? All right. Now, um, 
This came up already, so I don't even know if we need to worry about it now. But obviously, when, when you have quotation marks, you all know this, don't you? That you should basically, quotation marks come in pairs, okay? Come in pairs. <laughs> I know, I'm not kidding. I was just marking, I'm, I'm doing a summer course right now, and I was just marking a paper. And the paper, there, there was a paragraph where the writer had a quotation mark, okay, about five words in, okay? And then there wasn't a second quotation mark anywhere. <laughs> so, so that suggested that the rest of the paper was all one quote. So I, I know, I know I'm being obvious, but just be aware of that, okay? They come in pairs. <laughs> I know, anyway. And, uh, yeah. So the only other question really that comes up, a quotation within a quotation is punctuated with single quotation marks. So in other words, the outside part of the larger quote is still the double, right? And then inside, it's singular. And don't be a smart ass and email me. There's always one smart ass in class who would say, but what if I have a quotation within a quotation within a quotation? Yeah, go fuck yourself. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So capitalization. This is not easy. All right. I don't know why the sun keeps popping through or whatever. I hope you don't find that too distracting. But anyway, capitalization. Now, we're all aware that we capitalize the first person pronoun, I. That, that's, that's what we call the first person pronoun, the word I. But have you ever wondered why? There's a really neat story, and it goes back to printing presses. And it, it has to do with, at one time, uh, we had these tiles. I'm sure, again, you're probably aware of all this. And so if you were to set up your, your, the, the page that you wanted to, you know, photocopy, if you will, back in the 13th or 15th century, all right, 1435, around there, um, Gutenberg and all that, um, well, then you would you put all these little tiles together, okay? Actually, I know exactly what's causing that. Hang on a sec. Yeah, okay, that's better. So you would have all these little tiles, and you would put the words together. A tile meaning, like, each letter would have its own, you know, a tile. Okay, and it, it would have something called a bas relief, so the, the letter would be a bit out from the actual tile itself. And then you would put them all in a frame, and ink, you would ink everything, right, and make your copies, right? But what printers noticed was that because the letter I is so small, it's the smallest letter when it comes to these tiles, when they were doing their proofreading, right, making sure that everything was, was fine, quite often the I would be left out. And they would only catch it later on. And so, arbitrarily, they decided we should make that a capital. I'll always use it as a capital when it stands on its own. And that's the reason why we, uh, we uh, capitalize the first-person pronoun, right? I mean, you don't, you don't uh, capitalize you or we, okay? Only I. And it, it was more utilitarian than anything else. Interesting. I, I think it's interesting anyway. And then obviously we capital, I'm oh, sorry, I shouldn't say obviously, we capitalize the first word of a sentence. Well, obviously we do, right? English is one of the rare languages that does that. And I, I, I just thought I should point that out. Like, we shouldn't be arrogant as English speakers to think, well, you know, all languages do that. No, they don't. Very few, very few do. Okay, and English is one of them. Now, then we get into the names of specific titles. So, if I was to say I'm going to the doctor tomorrow, I wouldn't capitalize that, right? But if I said I am Dr. Smith, and now it's a title. Try and think of it that way all the time, right? It has nothing to do with the word itself. It has to do with, is it being used as a title or just as a generic term? President, not always capitalized. Prime Minister, not always capitalized, right? But if I'm talking about a specific Prime Minister and their name, well then, yeah, that's when you capitalize it, okay? Then the names of specific places. And the best way to, to remember that one is, can I find it on a map? So if I said to you, I'm, I'm going to be working out east this summer. Well, you can't really find out east on a map. But if I said, I'm going to be working in South Carolina. Well, I can find South Carolina on a map. So that's usually the best place to think about it. Again, it has to be specific. All right. Then we have the days of the week and the months of the year but not the seasons, okay? We're almost done, by the way. Not the seasons, okay? 
And again, you all think know that. Although, although quite often people do capitalize the seasons thinking they're supposed to and they shouldn't, unless it's being used as a title. Take a look at the course outline. I capitalized okay, the, 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 the season, right? But I'm using it as part of the title. Then the titles of publications and movies. And I think you guys know that, right? Right? Like, what, what, unless, of course, the movie itself or the publication doesn't capitalize. So you follow whatever, right? Um, but yeah, if you if you had a movie like, say, um, I don't know, my favorite film of the last five years, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, an amazing film if you understand this, the history of cinema. Um, well, then, in that case, you, there were certain words you would capitalize. We've been through that already, though. I've shown you that when it came to your first papers, right? Remember, if I circled l certain letters in your titles, it meant these are supposed to be capitalized. And so just remember as well that in, in cases like that, we don't capitalize what we call articles. By that, I don't mean a journal article. I literally mean words like of, a, an, the. Okay, Th that's what we mean by articles, okay? And then finally, the names of races, nationalities, languages, and religion, okay, and religions. And so there's an exception there, um, not an exception, but but one that you may be a bit unsure of, and that would be the word, uh, um, well, actually, no, I'm, I'm not even going to worry about that. So think about that, a race, a nationality, a language, or a religion. Oh, yeah, okay, I know what I was going to say here. The the Let's just say you were, like, someone always asks me, well, what about French toast? French toast has nothing to do with a language or nationality, right? Okay. Um, Belgian waffle. Okay. <laughs> Waffles weren't invented in Belgium. <laughs> so in other words, they have nothing to do with those rules. Okay. That, that's the one that I always get asked in class. All right. All right. Again, there's always one. Always one. All right. But what about? <laughs> and you already know what I'm my, my response was. Anyway, we're almost done. We're almost done. I gave the response earlier. I shouldn't do it again. Okay, finally, we have something called the subjunctive. And to tell you the truth, again, this is something you know through osmosis. But if you've ever wondered, okay, yeah, why why wouldn't I say if I was you, because it's all singular, it's, it, it's just a particular uh, mood of verb, right? A, a mood of a verb expressing what is imagined, wished, or possible. And so I don't know if I need to go through the examples with you. It's all right there. But again, if you grew up, you know, like listening to English, you know those things. And so, yeah, actually, if you want to look up something funny when it comes to the subjunctive, just type in uh, at any search engine, the Big Bang Theory, the television show, right? Big Bang Theory subjunctive. And there's a, a, a pretty good scene uh, with Sheldon and Bongos. All right. You can even just type in probably Sheldon and his bongos, and that would probably get it to you as well. Anyway, that's good enough for the day, I think. Uh, as I said, we're winding down. I'll probably be wearing the same shirt for lecture 10 because I'm probably going to do it in the next 10 minutes. All right. So anyway, let, let, let's call it a day on that. All right. Take care, everyone. OK, we'll see you.